Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Let's continue our lecture series on optimal control guidance and estimation. Uh, we are in the third lecture of this constrained optimal control, which, uh, which is going to be the last lecture in this constrained optimal control series. So, so far we have uh, seen uh, a little bit motivation of why we need and especially a lot of practical problems uh, demand that we explicitly account for that. Then we studied this uh, control constraint optimal control problems uh, in a generic framework. Uh, in the Pantriagin's minimum principle framework actually. Then we use that in time optimal control of uh, LTI system, you know, essentially the minimum time problem sort of thing and then demonstrated in detail about this double integral system. Okay. And fuel optimal control happens to be one of the topics in the book, but uh, because of lack of time, I uh, will rather leave it for self reading actually. Uh, you can read this uh, this topic from this uh, chapter 7, this phases actually, okay. it is not that difficult, it is very similar to time optimal control problem, just that there will be a singular arc in between and then uh, the function happens to be slightly different than just the I mean signum function actually. But largely today in this particular lecture we will talk about energy optimal control which is a, which is even more practically significant uh, especially in the framework of again linear time invariant system and then uh, and towards uh, towards end of this lecture we will also talk about straight state constraint optimal control which is again quite critical actually in, in many applications. All right, uh, so just a little bit round up of summary of Pantriagin's minimum principle. The problem that we have been talking about is uh, is fairly generic. Uh, we have this nonlinear system dynamics, okay, and then we want to optimize this generic cost function, okay, and it also satisfies these proper boundary conditions. We are interested in finding some sort of a admissible time history of control variable from T naught to T f. As compared to free optimal control or free optimization problems, so the only difference is control is constrained to lie on an admissible set actually, or in or component wise it lies uh, each of the component of control variable lies between some minimum and maximum value. Okay. So, in that setting we have also already seen that the necessary conditions of optimality are, are very very close to uh, I mean unconstrained case, but the only difference is the optimal control equation should satisfy this inequality. So, we can put it del s by del u equal to 0 and then try to solve a control actually. So, this inequality has to be carefully analyzed. And you have to actually see what uh, what u star okay, minimizes this, this Hamiltonian function actually. Okay, so the, that is that analysis has to be carried out in a careful manner. And even even if you see about uh, kind of numerical procedures, this uh, this constraint has to be accounted for rather than solving the control from that uh, del s by del e equal to zero. That's that's the only difference actually. But that's a huge difference. Just because of that difference, we end up with many different cases, different analysis, and all that actually. All right. So that is the that's the trick there. So now moving on to the energy optimal control of uh, especially linear time invariant systems. The problem is uh, natural in many many cases. For example, if you have uh, the control energy is, is typically it happens to be precious. And if you see electrical circuit, then the power consumption is I square R or V square V R. And if you consider this V as a, some sort of a control variable, then obviously we want to minimize that, that V square actually. Okay. And then if uh, control, I mean in aerospace problems, control magnitude is uh, is restricted. Okay. So, control surface deflection should be as small as possible, uh, especially to avoid saturation. As well as uh, we typically want to minimize that to have sufficient margin for unexpected situations as well. For example, uh, wind gust you have not taken into account, but suppose you wanted to want to cater for wind gust in uh, uh, while the plant is in operation, then it is better that we have some, some control margin left out if okay, some bounds are there, so that we can still exercise that. Okay. And also as a small remark, uh, rate of change of control which happens to be a, a strong function of energy drainage from the power source 
this is this is essentially some sort of a battery source in in aerospace vehicle that is small means it actually leads to some sort of smaller rates also okay so it is not really kind of obvious i mean it's not mathematically rigorous actually in other words somebody can also argue that okay magnitude is small okay okay but the the control bar, control can chatter within that actually okay so the rate can be infinite actually okay so those situations are aside typically when the control happens to be small okay it does i mean what happens is if you if you bound it small okay and then there's rate i mean it doesn't change that much actually so rate happens to be uh, sm i mean small also okay because if you if you see this finite difference sort of things rate is nothing but uh, like xk plus 1 minus xk by delta t sort of thing so if you fix delta t and the magnitudes are smaller then the rate happens to be smaller as well actually so usually it is smaller even though mathematically it cannot claim it actually all right so these are the small motivations why we want to talk about energy optimal control so what are pro what's the problem here we have a system dynamics in this form linear form x dot is x plus vu initial condition is known final time at t equal to tf x of tf should go to zero okay especially when tf is free okay uh, if tf is fixed then uh, this, i mean uh, it depends on where it wants to go i mean how the system behaves to that and things like that actually okay but ultimately uh, uh, this x of tf has to be zero okay because the, otherwise what will happen is you have to account for that in the cost function actually okay some some quadratic uh, terms will be there in the cost function if that is not there okay what you are interested in is x of tf should be equal to zero with uh, with this minimization actually the control the, the cost i mean cost functional to be minimized is a quadratic function of the control variable okay so tf is either fixed or, or free depending on the situation actually anyway so control constraint okay typically it is in a normalized sense it can be written something like that now magnitude of u is less than equal to 1 or component wise if you analyze then uh, each of the component uj is magnitude bound with with 1 so control variable is normalized and the normalizing quantity is absorbed in the b matrix actually okay so that that is that's what we have been talking about actually all right so uh, moving further uh, the energy optimal control system uh, formal statement happens to be like that uh, energy optimal control system is to um, uh, transfer the system dynamics from any initial state towards the origin at time tf okay either uh, which uh, with the time tf can be either fixed or free and at the same time it has to minimize this this cost function uh, with the control constraints in place actually yeah. so that's the formal definition of a energy optimal control problem now how do we go ahead and solve it we have this this uh, regular technique of, of applying necessary conditions of optimality so hamiltonian we define first l plus lambda transpose f so l happens to be half of u transpose r u okay and lambda transpose f happens to be ax plus b u okay so this is what is written l half of u transpose r u plus lambda transpose ax plus b u but i can expand that as lambda transpose ax plus lambda transpose b u now the state and costed equations uh, after that is, is like this x dot is del h by del lambda so again the same state equation appears with the optimal control function there okay and lambda dot is minus del h by del x so this is equal to minus a transpose lambda okay boundary conditions uh, x of t naught is x naught and lambda t f equal to 0 okay anyway so these are uh, so certain details there actually so it doesn't uh, doesn't matter to us so much about uh, this uh, this formulation and all very standard actually and also let me put a small remark which i have been telling that uh, if you see the book uh, everywhere you will see a star notation x x star lambda star like that actually here we are uh, purposefully taking out because the inequality that you are interested in is control inequality only okay so what you purposefully i put u star here and not uh, any star anywhere else actually but that doesn't mean that the st state and uh, lambda i mean state and costate are non optimal they are also optimal trajectories actually yeah. all right so this is the critical thing optimal control condition we want to analyze actually okay so when you want to when you want to analyze that uh, Hamiltonian of uh, x u star lambda should be less than equal to Hamiltonian of x lambda u basically. Okay. 
Arks you lam right can either way can put that okay. Well uh, we have been following x u lambda, so probably you can put that as x u lambda everywhere actually. Okay. This will be u, this will be lambda, and this will be oh sorry. Yes, okay. It is just a notation sort of thing. Anyway, so this coming back to Hamiltonian definition, okay, so uh, this expression has to be put there and one side is the optimal control function, one side is uh, no, any other control function actually. Okay. So, this same expression with u star in the left hand side and the same expression without u star, just, just u in the right hand side. You can see one term cancels out, lambda transpose x and lambda transpose x cancels out. Okay, and uh, what you are interested in is uh, something like this actually. Okay, this this inequality results in something like this. You have half of u transpose uh, r u with, with u star, and this expression with the lambda transpose b u star has to be less than equal to any other u basically. So the equivalent of telling that this expression is nothing but minimization of uh, this expression uh, with this uh, constraint uh, in place actually. Now, here is a little bit piece of analysis. Uh, first, we define q star as something like r inverse b transpose lambda and then this expression lambda transpose times b u star which appears here okay, can be actually exp I mean analyze a little further tell okay, a lambda transpose b u star is something like uh, its own transpose because ultimately it is a scalar quantity. So, you take its own transpose. So, you start uh, transpose b transpose lambda and then we introduce r times r inverse identity uh, r times r inverse is identity so we can we can introduce here and then observe that this quantity is nothing but q star okay so then we we note that lambda transpose b u star can be written as something like this also basically okay. so hence this uh, this inequality what i see here i can uh, write it something like this okay instead of that expression i'll rather prefer to use that expression okay there is reason for that actually. Okay. Now, after doing that we can add this quantity to both sides okay. and then you can, you can see that it essentially leads to some sort of a quadratic expression in the left hand side and quadratic expression in the right hand side. Okay. If you if you add this quantity here and this, this, this split it into two parts half of that plus half of the half of the one and one time you use this expression and one time you use that expression and, and, and then combine in, in matrix vector form then it turns out to be something like this. This is actually a quadratic term in the left hand side and quadratic term in the right hand side also. Okay. The difference is left hand side uh, has used u star function and right hand side has simply u function actually. Okay. All right. Uh, now, we define for algebra simplicity this term wh whatever term uh, I mean u plus q star sort of thing. Okay and w star is actually u star plus uh, q star. Okay. W is u plus q star and w star is u star plus q star. Okay. So, what you see is u plus q star here okay, and u star plus q star here that is the reason we want to kind of uh, simplify the algebra a little bit. Then the same expression what you see here so same inequality can be expressed as something like this inequality now. Okay. Okay. And that is nothing but the, this this minimization of this quantity with respect to this constraint. Basically. Okay. All right. So uh, this is this is the simplified notation form. Now here is a trick actually that uh, it's a flex from convex optimization that uh, this express I mean this inequality is true if and only if this inequality is also true. Okay. There is a cursory proof in the book. It's not very rigorous. Or some of you want to see, you can you can see that actually. Okay. So the, if this inequality is true, okay, if and only if this inequality is also true, provided R is a positive definite matrix. Okay. So R doesn't doesn't matter so much actually. Okay, as long as R becomes uh, R is a positive definite matrix actually. Okay. And utilizing this fact, okay, what you are telling is that this is this minimization of this quantity subject to this constraint is equivalent to minimization of that quantity subject to this constraint. Okay. So, this is a critical observation actually. Okay. We will 
without worrying so much on the proof part we will uh, we'll continue our analysis on, uh, assuming that this result is true. So, now, now we will end up with a case where you have to see that uh, we have to minimize this quantity w transpose w with respect to this constraint actually. Okay. But uh, this w transpose w with uh, with norm of I mean norm of u or modulus of u being less than 1 is nothing but this is just a quadratic expression. Okay. So, this w transpose w, w is a vector remember that. Okay. So, because definition of w is like this, w is a vector. Okay. So, w transpose w is nothing but summation of w j squares. Okay. It is uh, w 1 square plus w 2 square like that actually. Now, but w j by definition, if I just go through that and put the definition there, then the w j happens to be u j plus q j basically. right? This is the definition here. This is the vector, this is the vector. So, I can collect any component of w as component of that plus component of that basically. Okay, so, that we write it here actually, okay, u j plus q j stars whole square. Hence, the optimal control solution. Now, okay, here we, we are almost, we are almost there actually. Now, what you are telling is, we land up with a case where you have to minimize this quantity, okay, subject to this and this is nothing but that basically. Now, u j depends strongly on q j now, okay, and q j happens to be this definition, r inverse v transpose lambda and, and if you recall your uh, or uh, I mean uh, your knowledge about unconstrained optimal control, okay, then this expression pops up naturally, right? U star equal to minus R inverse V transpose lambda actually in that in that situation actually. Okay. So anyway, so that is we will end up with some some situation like this. Now let us see what value of U J I will select so that this quantity becomes minimum quantity basically. Okay. And remember this is a whole square term there actually. So each of the term has to be minimum. Okay. This this play, I mean u j plus q j star uh, whole square that means u 1 plus q 1 whole square plus u 2 plus q 2 whole square like that actually. So, to minimize the entire quantity I so we should have minimization of individual quantities actually. Okay. Now, if you analyze this uh, if you see this expression little carefully all that it tells is if q j q j star is uh, within the bound okay, that means it is it is inside that then all that is I, I can comfortably make it. Uh, negative of that and make it 0 basically. This expression can the minimum value is 0. So, if q j star modulus is less than equal to 1, then u j can be comfortably written as minus q j star because that will satisfy the control bound actually. Okay. However, if, uh, if uh, q j star is uh, something like less than minus 1 let us say, okay, then whatever quantities I will have, I should have to have a minimum quantity there. Okay. So, if it is less than minus 1, then the best I can do is probably by putting plus 1 there, okay. that is the magnitude bound actually. Okay. So, even if it is something like minus 3, it is still going to be minus, I mean the summation will be minus 2, if it is minus 4, then its summation will be minus 3, that is the maximum we can do actually. So, we just leave it there. And similarly, if q j star happens to be greater than plus 1, we just uh, we just take it as minus 1 actually. Okay. So, that is the that is the control uh, formula that we will end up with. And also again as a, as a remark, uh, what we see here is for even for a linear system, we will end up with a nonlinear controller actually. Okay, so, that is how it is. Anyway, so now to kind of read, write it in a compact form, we notice that the, we can we can make I mean take help of the saturation function, which is defined as something like this, if this input versus output and saturation function is defined like this if the magnitude by uh, if the magnitude is constrained within plus r and minus 1 then is, this is simply the same function output function is nothing but the input one but if it is beyond that then it is restricted to the bound value basically okay so if you if you take uh, take help of that then u star uj star happens to be the uh, saturation function of negative qj star that's all actually okay and uh, and Combining all the components, so you can write it in vector form as uh, something like this. Okay. Now, some comments or some observations rather. Uh, first of all, the energy optimal control law is described by saturation function, which is different from the signum function of for time optimal control. That is the bang bang control sort of thing, is defined by, by signum function. And it is also like a dead zone function for fuel optimal control control problems actually. Okay. Okay. this fuel optimal control problems. So, there we will end up with something like this actually, okay. we 
we have this uh, this kind of a thing actually okay sorry this is not let right mistake there there we want to minimize the magnitude of control and if you want to do that uh, there is some sort of a dead zone okay here it will be minus 1 okay this this value is is minus 1 this value is plus 1 and this value is plus 1 and this value is minus 1 like that actually you will end up with this uh, this this dead zone sort of control actually so bang off bang control basically for that take uh, i leave it to for, for i leave it to um, for self reading sort of thing so you just read it in the book and see so now the what happens here is in the in the singular arc between minus 1 to plus 1 control is really not defined when not defined people typically use zero control so it's uh, but still if you take uh, theoretically if you take zero control then it becomes a defined control basically so the control is simply not defined so we switch of switch of the control basically in, in a way basically. so these are singular arc problems but uh, but i mean if you talk about uh, energy optimal control it is a very well defined function it's actually a continuous function okay it uh, there is a minus 1 value it's it starts varying to plus 1 and then goes there actually so this singular arc sort of thing doesn't happen actually now u star is actually a continuous function of time this is this kind of a function is certainly a continuous function there are points at which the derivative is, is not defined its uh, derivative is discontinuous sort of thing but then uh, function sense it is continuous actually okay and here is a critical observation if the control is not constrained then u n star is just that minus r inverse v transpose lambda which is negative q star and hence uh, if q star this this constraint is in place q star modulus is less than equal to 1 uh, then the constraint and unconstrained optimal control are, are typically the same thing actually okay right so uh, all right so this is uh, now another another observation is the closed loop uh, okay closed loop uh, system is dictated by this this is uh, this function x dot is ax plus bu so x the x star dot is ax the but u happens to be something like this so it's reason of minus r inverse v transpose lambda so we can put that uh, and sometimes people write it as big letter sometimes it's, i mean write small letter like that actually so anyway so that is uh, x dot is a x star minus saturation b times saturation function of that okay. and then this system dynamics happens to be nonlinear actually so there is no closed form solution for that you cannot write in exponential solution sort of thing so it uh, the, if you really want solution of that then you have to do this numerical solution way actually okay all right so this is uh, this is what it is now the critical observation here is okay this this particular thing actually what we observe there the constraint and unconstrained problem happens to be very very close to each other basically okay that means if as long as it is within the bound i take the i be it behaves as if it is unconstrained problem actually and only when it crosses that limit then it is simply the same value the bound value basically and which is very intuitive i mean uh, even if you don't know optimal control theory sort of thing then this is how it, we we impl i mean we implement basically but naturally it turns out to be the case when you when you talk about quadratic uh, function of uh, u being minimized actually that means energy optimal control this this kind of a cost function actually okay. all right so that's an interesting observation now to to implement it okay we can have again two ways of implementing one is uh, an, an open loop implementation sense so that means uh, you, you can assume something like lambda 0 and compute lambda t because this expression is available with us we can we can solve it once your lambda 0 is available and then we can uh, evaluate use a star and then uh, then uh, you can solve the system trajectory and monitor whether what x of tf is 0 or not if it is 0 fine otherwise you come back and revise the lambda 0 uh, but that's not very good because uh, there are infinite and, uh, i mean trials you have to do to get it there and so and hence this is not a very good procedure basically and there should be this numerical procedure of how to adjust this lambda 0 in a proper direction and all that to be like sorting method sort of thing but we are not talking about that actually okay 
So, we are what you are interested in especially because it is a linear uh, linear problem sort of thing we are interested in having some sort of a closed loop or, or state feedback control actually. But anyway if somebody wants to implement this way this is this is how it is you start with some some uh, guess value of lambda 0 then solve this system this is uh, a transpose ok and then uh, get your lambda of t and then get your q star pass, pass it through the saturation function here and then u star is available, but monitor x star how it develops and at t equal to t f is it 0 or not. If it is 0 then stop it otherwise continue actually. All right, but what you are interested in is closed loop implementation uh, as a state feedback form. So, we are interested in some sort of a function and we can still pass through that saturation function sort of thing so that you will get optimal control. So, can we do that? And that is demonstrated again through a, through a small example because it depends on case to case actually. All right, uh, let us start uh, uh, that example. We have x dot is x plus u where a is negative actually. So, it is a kind of a stable system and we also know that for stable systems typically the co-state dynamics is unstable. So, just remember that actually we will need that actually. Okay, anyway performance index is like this. So, if once you have u square dt then r half and you can put r, r equal to 2. Okay. So, we have uh, a is a small a and b is 1 and q is not there of course and r is 2 basically okay. and t f is free and control is bound with uh, with uh, absolute value of u being less than equal to 1. So, that is the standard problem actually. So, we have this Hamiltonian u square uh, I mean u square coming from uh, coming from this cross function l, l is u square plus lambda transpose f lambda times a x plus lambda times u basically ok. Now, state equation uh, x dot is uh, del s by del lambda. So, a x plus uh, u star, but remember a is uh, negative quantity again I emphasize that actually. Okay. So, co-state equation happens to be negative of uh, del s by del x actually ok. So, that happens to be uh, minus a lambda basically ok. So, that means minus a is positive remember. So, so lambda dot is now a, uh, now a unstable equation actually. So, up to optimal control we already derived that has to be a saturation function of minus r inverse b transpose b, b is not there b is I mean b is 1. So, that is not written here. So, minus r inverse lambda that means r is nothing but 2. So, r inverse is half actually. So, saturation function is nothing but negative of lambda by 2 basically and saturation function defined this way again. So, u star happens to be plus 1 ok. If lambda by 2 is less than minus 1 ok, it happens to be minus 1 if lambda by 2 is greater than plus 1 or it happens to be just negative of that value ok, lambda I mean minus lambda by 2 if this is within the bound actually ok. All right. So, this may not be needed we are not using lambda star anywhere actually ok. All right. Anyway, so that is that's all right actually. Okay, so we can also see that u star is equal to minus uh, lambda by two. It can also be obtained from the unconstrained optimization. But once you have del s by del u equal to zero, and h is that del s by del u is two u plus lambda equal to zero. So it is u equal to mm, minus lambda by two basically. Okay, so that comment is still there basically. All right. So, now coming to the analysis part of it, we want to have some some closed loop or straight feedback sort of solution actually. So, we go back to the co-state equation first ok and co-state equation solution is this way. Remember a is negative, so minus a is positive actually ok. So, this is the solution ok and also note that lambda 0 is 0 ok is not admissible because once lambda 0 is 0 ok lambda t happens to be 0 it will remain at 0 and if lambda t happens to be 0 then uh, then u star happens to be 0 ok all the time actually. And then uh, e x of t has to be just the homogeneous system ok and this homogeneous system will never reach to the origin in finite time actually ok. So, that is typically ruled out actually. Now, what you see is uh, we dip, now this solution is still valid lambda t equal to e to the power t into lambda of 0 but it has now 4 regions actually we, we have to talk in something like uh, lambda of 0 is 0 to 2 or it is greater than 2 
or it is minus 2 to 0 or it is less than minus 2. The reason being if it is uh, it if it lies between 0 to 2 okay. Okay, now I will come back to this slide. It, the solution nature happens to be something like this actually. Okay. If it starts between something something there, then it remains there. And if we start somewhere inside this bound, okay, minus 2 to plus 2, if it starts in a positive direction, it will sometime T A, it will cross that and go away. If it happens to start within this 0 to minus 2, so at some time T C, it will, it will cross and go away actually. Okay. Otherwise, it will remain outside the bound. These are the four cases that we are we are talking actually. So, if it is uh, if it is there, why it is important? Because once the, this one crosses this bound of plus two, then the saturation is in place actually. Control saturation is in place. Within that, it is is, is not in place sort of thing actually. Okay. So that is why we are talking about that. So, if it is that, u star is either that, either minus uh, lambda by two or I mean you take uh, this value okay, minus lambda by 2 a minimum of that value actually. Okay. That means initially it will be like that and later it will stabilize it that that is the meaning of this, this curly bracket actually. Okay. If it is always greater than 2 in that in that case lambda remains to be greater than 2 and the optimal solution happens to be minus 1 just the saturation value sort of thing and similar analysis is there if it is uh, within the, within this bound. Okay, then at some time T C you will uh, it will cross that. So, until that we apply minus lambda by 2 and then then stay at plus 1 actually. Okay. And if it happens to be this side then it is always saturated. So, it happens to be like that actually. All right. So, this this diagram I already explained actually. Now, coming back to the closed form solution that is your hunting out actually. How do you get that? So, here is a critical observation. We know that on optimal path Hamiltonian is a constant function. And if time T f is free, Hamiltonian happens to be 0 actually, it, because T t I mean finally, the Hamiltonian will go to 0. Now, Hamiltonian uh, if you just go back and see what is the expression for Hamiltonian, this is the expression for Hamiltonian. So, here we can substitute that and tell the okay, this expression happens to be 0 and there I can solve for u as a function of x and lambda basically okay. or I can solve for x as a function of u and lambda either way basically. Okay. So, this is solved for x as u and lambda, this, this constant equation will be analyzed in detail basically. Now, we talk about a saturated region and unsaturated region separately basically. Okay. Now, if it happens to be saturated region at t equal to T a, because this is remember this is T a or T c either way. So, the what is that particular what is that that particular value of x at that particular time basically that is we are interested in. So, at time t equal to T a, lambda of T a happens to be 2 and u star happens to be minus 1. So, we plug it back here this expression whatever expression you are having u star is minus 1 and lambda is going to be 2. So, if you plug it that you get 1 over, 1 over 2 basically. Okay. And similarly, at t equal to t c lambda of t c is minus 2 the other case actually what you are telling and x of t c we get a value now basically. In unsaturated region u star is a saturation function of this quantity. So, this happens to be negative lambda by 2. So, the Hamiltonian condition you again you go back and substitute that u as a function of lambda if you substitute that you will end up with some, some quadratic expression in terms of lambda now. Basically. So, either lambda is 0 or lambda is 4 x actually, but lambda 0 is ruled out we just saw that little, little before actually. Okay. So, lambda 0 is not possible it is not admissible. So, the only condition is uh, lambda has to be equal to 4 x and hence u star equal to minus lambda by 2 and there is nothing but minus 2 x. So, summarizing all these what you can see is if x is less than that because instead of condition on lambda we this point of time we got a value for x also and remember x is also I mean kind of monotonic actually in a way. Okay. So, we got uh, the value for x at this particular time or this particular time that will kind of give us a feedback sort of formula and which will tell okay, I can summarize this uh, something like a condition on x not condition on lambda really. Okay. So, I will get uh, if, if x is less than this one remember a is negative again. So, this is a negative quantity if x, if x is less than that, but it is within that uh, I mean uh, sorry outside that basically x is less than that then I will have minus 1 x is greater than that quantity then I will have plus 1 okay. and otherwise if it is within the bound then I can I can operate that way. Actually. So, this is a state feedback formula basically. Okay. All right. So, this is what I wanted to talk in terms of this uh, this energy optimal control problem and also it depends on case to case if you have the nonlinear problem and uh, or 
different sort of uh, little more complex uh, cost function and all analysis has to be slightly different. Now, steps are laid out and you have to analyze uh, in those steps actually basically. Okay. So, with that I think we will migrate to the state constraint problem now before, before we wind up this series of uh, lectures on constant optimal control. So, state constraint problem uh, has been studied from a variety variety of uh, I mean uh, analysis tools essentially and uh, obviously everything is not possible to possible for me to talk. So, I will confine into two methods, two elegant methods rather basically. So, first thing it talks about is penalty function method sort of thing. So, let us see if what it is actually. So, suddenly you come out of this uh, this Pantreazin uh, principle and things like that, we are we are talking about state constraint issues here actually. So, it the, the different tricks have to be applied here, unless it is a mixed state and control constraint that that has to be I mean that is again a topic uh, in general actually. You can have problems with state, state constraints as well as control constraints. So, that is that is what it is, but here we are typically confined uh, to primarily state constraint actually. Anyway, system dynamics uh, we will go back to nonlinear systems, system dynamics is nonlinear, performance index is energetic okay. and then the constraints are there several constraints. In fact, uh, uh, 1, 2, 3 up to p constraints are, uh, are there okay, some sort of algebraic functions okay, which has to be greater than equal to 0, that is a very generic way of looking at it. The only condition is p has to be less than equal to n, n is the dimension of the state actually. Okay. Otherwise, it may lead to some sort of over constraint problem and all that actually. So, we do not uh, want to land up there actually. Anyway, so the, uh, also there is another assumption which tells that the constraint functions, whatever functions we are talking here, okay, they have continuous first and second order partial derivatives. In other words, they are kind of smooth functions in all variables actually. Okay. How do you handle that? So, one idea is like this. So, all these constraint function I will collect whatever whatever constraint functions are there and I will write some sort of a state equation additional auxiliary state equation x n plus 1 dot as some f n 1 x of t where this f n plus 1 I will define it this way g 1 square times uh, h of g 1 plus g 2 square uh, g 2 square times h of g 2 like that and what are these h actually h, h is nothing but uh, something called unit heavy side step function defined as something like this. In other words, if the constraint is satisfied, then it is 0. If it is not satisfied, then it is 1, then, then this is in place actually. Okay. If, if it is, if it is uh, the constraint is satisfied is not in place, okay. if it is satisfied is in place actually. But critical observation is, uh, remember this is either 0 or 1, so it cannot be negative each of the quantity okay. and each of these coefficients are also positive quantity. Okay. That means, x n plus 1 dot is always guaranteed to be a positive quantity actually. Okay. I mean, a greater than equal to 0, either it can be 0 or it can be, it can all, it is guaranteed to be greater than 0 basically. But the interesting phenomenon is, this equation also demands a boundary condition. In, plate, in fact, optimal control means we want a two boundary conditions really for, for each state equation and these two boundary conditions that you want to put purposefully is something like this, x n plus 1 at t 0 is 0 and x n plus 1 t f is also 0. Remember, it starts with some value and it has to land up with that same value only and both are zeros actually. Okay. Now, it is possible only when all this, uh, only when this heavy side function is 0 actually. That means, all state equations, I mean all constraints are satisfied. If one is not satisfied, then uh, this is guaranteed to be positive and even if it starts with uh, some 0 value it is going to go away actually, it is not going to come back to 0, okay, because at no point of time the derivative is really negative actually. Okay. So, that is the whole idea there. So, essentially what it does is, this formulation makes it some sort of an infeasible problem unless all constraints are satisfied, that is the critical observation actually. All right. Now, now what is happening? We have a, an additional state equation, additional two boundary condition, that is all we have actually. Okay, so, we have this original problem, but in addition to that, we are imposing this one, this state is, I mean additional auxiliary state equation along with these two boundary condition, which, which forces the system to satisfy the constraints actually. Okay. So, now the rest of the things are plain algebra sort of thing, you have Hamiltonian which is the, the L plus lambda transpose f, but we have a one more equation, so lambda n plus 1 times f n plus 1 actually. Okay. 
right. This this term lambda n plus 1 times f n plus 1 is coming in addition to what we already have. And state equation obviously, we have one more state equation okay. and co-state equation also we have one more co-state equation. Okay. So, it will follow like that actually, but optimal control equation in general when I mean if you account for control constraints also in the on the way then you have to talk about this way. Okay. This Hamiltonian has to be less than that and you have to analyze there actually carefully. Again, I am not taking take I mean these are these, these require numerical procedure to solve it also basically and there are there are efficient ways of doing that as well. I am not going to lay out any numerical procedure in this lecture. I am just telling you the ideas here okay. and rest of the things you can you can study in some reference literature also the thing actually. So, it, the whole idea here is you have this set of constraints and how to handle with that constraint. The constraints you can one way of doing that is putting these things and then carrying out rest of the things actually an auxiliary state equation along with two boundary conditions which is guaranteed to I mean if you if, if these are satisfied then the problem is guaranteed to satisfy this this constraints actually this, the whatever solution you get. Anyway, so this is what it is rest of the things are algebra. All right, so observation is we, have, we end up with 2 n not only 2 n but 2 n plus 2 differential equations ok, one for x n dimensional state and one more and x n plus 1, one for lambda and uh, n dimensional co-state and then uh, the corresponding n plus 1 uh, this this is a vector where this is a scalar actually. Okay. And also remember when you do this algebra this del h by del x and all that now we should remember that this the, these are also I mean this Hamiltonian contains this f n plus 1 and f n plus 1 contains this heaviside functions. And heavy side function is kind of a discontinuous function actually. Okay, but having said that, uh, it is discontinuous only at one one point that is x equal to zero that too. Okay, so we can ignore that. But uh, irrespective, I mean, other than that, it's actually a constant. The com the value of the constant is different, but actually it's a constant value. Okay, so don't get confused with that. Uh, the derivative has to be taken and all that. As far as these derivatives are concerned, del s by del x and all, these functions what you see here, these heavy side functions can be treated as constants actually. Okay. So, that is that is how it is actually that is what is written here. Okay. Heavy side step functions are treated as constant functions in the co-state equation while evaluating this, this expression actually. And in fact, if you are interested curious to see examples, you can see a typical a small textbook example in, in the NIDA book actually okay. that is that small example actually. All right. So, what are the boundary conditions that you are talking here? One is this boundary condition, which is already available. These two are imposed. So these two boundary conditions are also available. But we still have, we are still not done because we still need to have boundary conditions some lambda f, t f, if it is free, like that actually. So these boundary conditions can still be obtained from this general transversality condition. And suppose t f is fixed, then this is zero. So this is gone. And x f is free. So I mean, if you if you consider that way, then it ultimately what happens is this has to be 0 that means lambda f is alpha by del x which is known to us actually. Okay. So, like that actually. So, uh, so, boundary conditions have to be 2 n plus 2, n is here, 2 are here and n more will come from here. Okay. And if T f is also free one more will come with depending on the situation Hamiltonian final time has to be equal to 0 if, and depending on situation like that actually. We have talked about that in, in early classes actually when you talked about calculus of variations really. Anyway, so this is the summary of it. Okay, the the next next idea, or the, rather the last idea that I want to talk in this class, is something called slack variable method. It's a it's a different idea altogether, which is very elegant in my view actually. And in fact, uh, it's uh, it's also called Valentine's method. Okay, so it's because of this uh, method, I mean uh, because of F. A. Valentine who first proposed this idea in some sort of static optimization sense actually. But anyway, so coming back, uh, this is the same problem. Now, for more generality, we are having a penalty function also, the terminant penalty also here. Okay. And then we have this constraint in place, and for simplicity, we will take that as something like a scalar constraint. Uh, so, that is the reason why S is taken actually. But in general, it can be vector also, it does not hurt actually. The, the formulation does, uh, is without loss of generality you will end up with more number of state equations actually that is how it is. But assume that S is this is a scalar function which is one constraint uh, in place, but S is actually p th order okay. that means what do, what do you mean by a function being p th order the definition is like this. 
if you take p times derivative p times time derivative then you will ex appear explicitly very close to what we know in dynamic inversion actually those of you know that okay so if i take uh, p th time derivative of this function okay then the control appears explicitly in the p th order derivative okay. And normally we, we have this uh, either first or second order derivative with this control will start appearing uh, I mean most of the cases we have this let us say a height constraint in a, in a vehicle then h dot is v sin gamma and then if you take double dot of that then gamma dot appears and then control start appearing actually okay. So like that actually either uh, that way actually but in general it can be p third order actually now how do you handle that how do you how do you analyze that actually now idea is something very very elegant. So, we actually introduce some sort of a slack variable alpha okay, and then impose this constraint rather in equality sense. Okay. So, whatever what happened to be an inequality here, we want to impose this, this alpha actually. But remember this is also a slack variable, the, it is actually a slightly different in the sense of this KKT condition, this case is called Karus Kuntakur condition, the static optimization. Well, that is way I mean if you recall that the at that point of time we had the slack variable, but the slack variable computation was not done and that was mainly analyze mainly for analysis only basically okay. It led to some elegant results of course basically, but here we are interested in computing this alphas actually okay. So, that is the critical dif difference actually okay. So, we, we have this inequality constraint, but we introducing this slack variable alpha we make it equality constraint first and depending on the problem we want to really compute alpha basically. Okay. Now, we differentiate this this expression start different in differentiate this expression. So, obviously, we have this s dot s dot is written as s 1 s double dot is written as s 2 like that actually. Okay. So, then if you take first time derivative because it is identically 0 all right hand side will be 0 and the first one will be s 1 plus alpha times alpha 1 alpha times alpha dot rather equal to 0 then take second derivative it will happen to be like that you continue up to pth derivative actually okay. Now, here terms will involve alpha alpha dot alpha double dot or alpha 1 alpha 2 like that actually up to alpha p. So, it will contain alpha 0 third order derivative up to p third order derivative terms it will contain actually okay. All right. So, now what actually? So, this is the definition of S 1 what do you mean by S 1 and what do you mean by alpha 1 like that actually ok. So, do not forget that it is d s by d t means we can compute this del s by del x because s is a function of states basically. So, del s by del x into d x dot and like that you can continue actually similar alpha 1 by definition is d alpha by d t actually. Anyway, now coming back what happens is we are assuming that uh, it uh, this function is p third order that means u appears explicitly. Okay, if I take p third order derivative here. So, from this p third order derivative constraint this this express this equation okay, I can actually solve for the control in terms of other variables okay, right. This this uh, utilizing this expression I can actually solve this control in terms of other variables actually and that is that is where I symbolically we can write uh, something like this u equal to some function of x alpha and its derivatives okay. So, this is the critical observation really actually okay. Then what happens I will go back and try to uh, substitute my uh, my control in terms of that okay. Remember f, f, x dot is f of x u and t of course okay. So, x of uh, f of x u u I can substitute in that that way because this is u right x dot is f of x u t basically. So, whatever u is there u is that okay. So, I will substitute that as that then here I will I will treat this alpha p as control variable new control variable all other things are states actually. So, that means I have introduced new states alpha alpha 1 things like that up to alpha p minus 1 actually. So, p more states are coming basically and alpha p is treated as control variable. So, by first company I mean this first canonical form and all that if you if you see that uh, first companion form and things like that. This is this one you can uh, you can write it alpha dot equal to alpha 1 alpha 1 dot is alpha 2 all sort of things definition and alpha p plus p alpha p minus 1 dot is nothing but alpha p okay and this alpha p happens to be a control variable basically okay. Now, what are the conditions we also need uh, initial conditions for that remember that actually okay. 
So, uh, alpha t equal to t 0 is alpha t 0, these are definitions alpha 1 t 0 and things like that. So, we need values for that, then only the differential equations are complete actually. Now, how do you do that? This, this is also not that weird because we know these expressions now, right? We started with that, this expression actually. So, if you, if you happen to, I mean, if, why can't we solve for alpha, alpha 1 like that actually, okay? Sequentially, you can solve for that and we utilizing this expression, we can first get alpha t naught at that. Remember, x naught is available to us, that is initial condition. So, it happens to be just a function of x naught only basically, okay? X naught and the constraint form, whatever is the constraint form actually, okay? I think this is, yeah. Okay. I think there is a small print mistake here. Let me correct that. Okay, these are this is like S basically. Okay, this is S1, this is S2, like that actually. Okay. okay. So from there you can see that actually. So from the constraint equation expression uh, and knowing the initial condition, we can know, we can know the initial conditions for T naught. Uh, I mean these guys also. The small ambiguity here, uh, but uh, uh, but typically I think if uh, I'll try for minus first, and then then go for plus actually, okay, because all other happens to be minus. So to retain that same thing. But either way, it is it is okay because as far as constraint is concerned, uh, both the values will satisfy that. Okay, that's not a problem. Okay. All right, so that is that is how I will I will select actually. Okay. All right, now all right. So what you are telling here is we have these additional state equations, and we have we know we want to know these initial conditions, and these initial conditions are available. That's that's the critical observation actually. So it makes the problem complete really basically. Okay. So the cost function is a matter of writing, rewriting the cost function also instead of L, instead of U, wherever U appears, I will substitute that and then treat it as something like a n plus p dimensional problem actually. Okay. In other words, if I define a state vector as x and n all these p vectors, alpha alpha one up to alpha p minus one, then I can rewrite the system dynamics as z dot is some some other function f of z alpha p times t alpha p t where alpha p is my control variable and similarly the cost function can be written also like that. So, in the in this I mean in this expanded state vector with the high dimensional state vector the problem gets redefined actually where everything else is known to uh, we know the differential equation that is it is these are very simple differential equations anyway and uh, the associated initial conditions are also available to us which happens to be derived from the same state equation same uh, kind of constant equation function. Okay. So, it is elegant actually in that sense. So, from there onwards it is algebra, okay. Then summary sense we can we can always talk like uh, we redefine the state vector as uh, something like this, a uh, larger dimensional state vector, control we treat that as alpha p and then rest of the things we know how to do, we define a Hamiltonian that way and then the state equation happens to be this one in, in z and lambda dot happens to be like that and, and, and things like that. Okay. Remember a uh, part of this uh, del phi by del z will happen to be simply 0's actually. Uh, phi is a function of x not alphas. So, when this alpha part comes there, th that part will become 0's actually. The optimal control equation happens to be that way. Okay. So, and remember we have actually what is the trick here? By doing all these, okay, the constraints are accounted for. But absolutely, uh, I mean this alpha p when it comes to that, there is no constraint on that. It is actually unconstrained control problem, okay. Because this, right, I mean wh when you come back, come to here, okay, there is no constraint equation, alpha p is still uh, free basically that way. So, because alpha p is free, we can go out and straight away use that actually, del s by del alpha p equal to 0, okay. So, this is I think in my view is kind of elegant uh, method, slug variable method and, uh, and if you end up with some problem like that, you can give a try in this method actually because it, it is not, see heavyside, uh, the other approach with uh, using this heavyside uh, function and all is, is, is mathematically makes sense, but uh, you may struggle numerically actually, okay. it may not happen, it may then uh, you may have to really struggle hard to tune the design in a, in a good way. But I think the slack variable approach is, is kind of a natural way of handling the problem basically. 
you have this uh, with inequality constraint and you make it equality by introducing this at this function here right there and then rest of the things are algebra and it elegantly turns out that you can not only derive the state equations but you can also get the associated initial conditions for that actually all right so this is all about what i wanted to talk in this constraint optimal control series and uh, certainly i'll encourage you to to read many things including thorough reading of this uh, this chapter 7 of uh, of this uh, naidu book actually there are several uh, elegant uh, so I means kind of review papers also available which you can see many things but after knowing some of these things things may be easier for you now actually so i think with that i will i will stop this lecture thank you